So I think this video needs an intro. We received lots of questions asking us to cover Houdini's new rendering engine, Karma. And we've been always a bit hesitant, because it's still in beta and has its quirks. But we thought, well, why not try covering it today, or at least experimenting with it a bit. And I thought I had had a setup prepared that would work every time. But it turns out that working with a beta rendering engine has its surprises. So take the following video as what you want. Cautionary tale, cry for help, real life comedy, or just a documentation of what working with a beta software in reality looks like. As you're surely aware, Houdini nowadays ships with two rendering engines. Mantra, the legacy engine, which is very capable, very versatile, and a bit sluggish sometimes. And Karma, the new kid around the block, being USD-based, interactive, but still in its beta stage. Nevertheless, if you want to try out Karma, here is my simpleton's guide to using it. I'm saying simpleton because I think the way I use Karma here might not be as intended by the developers. As I'm trying to circumnavigate most of the USD workflows and try to stick more to a OBJ and SOP-centric workflow. Let's get started. So this is your default Houdini star screen. To use Karma, I'm gonna switch over to Solaris, the new lighting context and the new USD context of Houdini. And the first thing I want to do here is bring in some geometry. And there are two ways of doing that. Traditionally, we'd be working in SOPs. So we'd been working in the OVJ level here and, for example, build some test geometry. Maybe this pig head here. Let's dive in there and uncheck Add Shader. Let's go back to our stage, that is the Solaris context here, and bring in this geometry we just created using a SOP import. And in here, we pointed to the SOP path we want to import. So that's my test geo pig head, or we could even just select the whole OBJ node here. So let's hit accept and we see our pig head brought in here. Next, to render this, I want to add an environment light by control clicking on the end light here, which will wire the light down below the sub import and also as control click on the camera to create a camera. See, that's all been wired in here. Let's just select an HDR for our dome light here, going in the base properties in the texture and then clicking here and in the file selector node, let's just drag down here and uncheck show sequences as one entry and select this summer shade. Oh, one. So that's our very, very basic scene setup. And if you want to see Karma in action, let's just up here, switch to Karma. And after a bit of noodling, we can see this image converging here. And you can see it's pretty interactive, pretty fast. And also I want to pin my viewport to the camera I just created by clicking this lock icon here. So that's working. Now let's give this pig head some material. To do that, I'll wire in a material library below my geometry here and dive in there. And in here, I'm going to create a shader. And the shader I found working most reliably, although not always, keep in mind Karma is still in beta, is the principal shader. Let's drop that down, select a color, maybe this muted orange here, and go up one level. And in the material library node, let's assign this material we just created, namely the principal shader here, to our geometry. And just select the preset in this case, I want to assign the material to all mesh primitives. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, we're seeing a scene tree here. That's what we're building. So when we select the material library here and highlight the sub import, we can see this is the mesh, the geometry we imported. So instead of this geometry path here, we can also just take this mesh and drag it over in here. Let's just unhide this. Yeah, sometimes Karma has issues refreshing the changes we just made. So let's just switch back and forth between Houdini GL. So in my case, a Houdini restart fixed it. That is the beauty of working with beta software. But you can see now we assigned this material to our pig head here. Next, let's go back to our OBJ level and dive into our test geometry that we created here and maybe drop down a subdivision node. Give this a few subdivisions. And now let's drop down an Atrib randomize node, which will randomize the color value on the mesh called CD, which is stored as a point attribute here. Let's go back to our stage here. And we can already see that the color here is coming through. That is because in our material library on the principal shader here, we checked use point color. So if we set the base color to white, we can see our points color coming through. So that's working. Let's go back to our OBJ level. And in here, let's create another attribute, this time using an attribute noise. And let's set this attribute name not to CD, but to something custom. For example, Mo, and go back to our Solaris stage level here. Now, if I want to access this attribute called Mo, let's first check if it's there. So on our mesh here, we drag this over, drag over the name. We can see we imported the attribute Mo as a primvar, as it's called in this context. So and it's bringing over those values, a vector with three components. So that's good. Now, what I would usually do in the shading context here is drop down a bind, set this to vector to import those three components and set its name to Mo. And then I'd wire this into my base color here, which now if we go back up here, we can see results in this black shader. So that does not work. And so far I found two methods of coping with this. One was a bit unreliable and it relied on the principled shader core. And if you drop that down, you will see 
it doesn't have this material output flag, so let's just activate this. And then on the base color, let's set that to white and also drag in this bound vector onto the base color, like so. Let's go up one level and assign this material we just created, the principal shader core. And again, we had to refresh this manually by just switching from our stage to our OBJ and then back to our stage. And now this is updating. So now we can see as we selected the shader core here, the attribute called Mo that I created will be brought in here. However, this shader core lacks a bit of the comfort and the features that the principal shader has, as it's only the core of this principal shader. So what if I want to bind this attribute, this custom attribute called Mo into my principal shader. Well, let's just first cut this wire here and then right click on the principal shader and select allow editing of contents, then dive in here and you will be greeted with this spider's web. And this is the shader. So let's zoom into this area here a bit and we're interested in this base color here. This too is a sub network, so right click on it and select allow editing of contents, then dive in there. And finally, in here, in this purple node up here, we can select which name our point color attribute for the base color has. And in my case, I want to rename this from CD to Mo, like so. Let's go up and one more level and one more level. And in here, now I'll assign my principal shader to my geometry. And now we can see the shader two is reading in my custom attribute values correctly. Next, let's shade and render something a bit more intricate. And instead of using this sub import, I want to use a sub create. That's the other method of creating and working with sub data in Solaris. So dive in here and you'll be greeted with this network where you can drop down your standard sub nodes as in your geo context. In my case, I want to load in a file and I'm going to select a 3D scan, which I downloaded from Manuel's new page exterior, where you can download 3D scans of biomes. That means sets of nature. So give it a try. They're also offering a bunch of free assets here. And I just downloaded this mushroom here. So let's just select the high FBX. And after that, let's drop down a transform wire this in here, click move centroid to origin, and let's scale this down to one hundredth of its original size. Middle mouse on this and you will see we've got normals and UVs on this. So let's go up again to my lighting context here into the Solaris stage. And instead of the sub import, let's wire the sub create into my tree here that I built. And let's reframe this by just locking the camera to the viewport again and zooming in here onto this mushroom. Let's just click on the background to deselect it. So really nicely high detail scan of this mushroom. Let's set up materials for this by going into the material library. Let's just deselect the material bob for now. Just delete this and delete the geometry path as well because we want to reassign this to point to the mushroom mesh that we just downloaded. So now let's dive into the material library and drop down another principal shader. Call this one maybe mushroom. And in here, I want to set my base color to white, set my IOR to 1.33. And this 3D scan comes with a bunch of textures. So let's just select the relevant ones in the textures tab here, drag this down. And I want to have a base color texture, which I'll select. So that is this one here. I'd like to use a roughness texture, just going to select that too. So that's this one here. Let's maybe also select a reflectivity texture, which should be the specular and maybe add a bit of bump map to this by going to the bump and normals tab, enable this, setting the texture type to bump. And in my texture path, let's just point this to the bump map here. And in my previous tests, uh, an effect scale of 0 0.025 seemed to be nice. So let's save this, go up to our stage context here and in the material library, let's just select the mushroom shader we just built. And now you can see those textures coming in into this rendering nicely. Save this and give this a ground plane by dropping down a grid. No need to create this in SOPs here. I can just directly create this here. Let's just move this over. And before we assign materials to all of this, let's just merge both the mushroom we created using the sub create and the grid. And let's move down this grid here, just using those handles, maybe just switch to Houdini GL for now. So we have a bit of a better response time here. Let's also create a material for the background we just created by going into the material library again, dropping down another principal shader, calling this maybe BG for background. Let's set this to a very bright light gray. Set his IOR to 1.3 as well. Roughness at 0.3 is fine for now, I think. And let's just assign this. So in our material library now, we just add another material we want to assign. And we're going to assign it to this grids mesh here. So that goes into the geometry path. And let's just point it to the BG material bob we just created. Now let's look back through our camera, maybe lock this to the viewport, zoom out a bit. And in my camera itself, I want to set the focal length under the view tab to maybe 85 millimeters, like so. Save this and switch our renderer to comma. So now the 
background, the underground here is coming through nicely. Let's talk a bit about render settings and adjusting the render settings on this one. So let's just switch to GL again and go to the four split. The first thing I want to do is on my camera with the camera selected and the tool handle selected, I want to press Z over the viewport here and zoom out a bit until I get this. This is the focus slider. So I want to set the focus point to somewhere around here so it focuses on the mushroom. And then on the camera's sampling tab, I want to increase the f-stop. So this slider now shows me an approximation of the area that's in focus. However, this f-stop slider currently to me seems broken in Karma because you need grotesquely large values to get an image that's not totally blurred out. So in my previous attempts, a value of around 100 to 128 seemed necessary. So let's just leave it at that. And now let's set up our render engine. So this is our tree and I want to add two nodes here. One is the render geometry settings, which I'll wire in before the camera. And one is the comma render properties, which I'll wire in after the camera and highlight. Also, let's switch our viewport back to a single view here. And in here, first in the render geometry settings, let's drag that down. I want to set my diffuse samples, that's the diffuse bounces and the reflect samples and refract samples up. So let's set them to set or create and leave them at four bounces each. The default settings for Karma are available if you switch your viewport to Karma and hit D. So now under the render tab, you can see the default settings. So a diffuse limit of one was what we had previously. However, now we are overriding this using the render geometry settings here. Then we assign our camera and after that we go into the comma render properties. And in here I want to assign this camera to the render properties, just dragging it up here. And now under the rendering tab, I want to enable depth of field. So sometimes the updates on this do not work reliably. And in this case, I'll just select the camera, cut it, cut it using control and X, just refresh the viewport and pasting the camera again. And now let's try fiddle around with this F stop here. Maybe this needs another nudge by switching over to the OBJ and back to the stage context here. And although I restarted Houdini, restarted my workstation and installed the current Houdini production build, neither of those measures fixed it. Karma just isn't updating my depth of field settings here, although it previously worked in my previous file. So that's the beauty and the difficulty of working with software that still very much feels like it's in beta and behaves very unpredictable. So in theory, that's how you'd set up depth of field. It's just not coming through in this case. One thing I'd like to do here is still keep tweaking my dome light a bit, add a bit of intensity here, maybe like this. And one last thing I want to do is set up a bit of subsurface on this mushroom here. I think it could really benefit from it. So let's dive back into the material library. And in our mushroom shader here under the surface tab, let's first drag this down to subsurface here, increase our subsurface contribution scale and set the subsurface mode to random walk. Karma. So you can now see we're getting a bit of subsurface here. Well, quite substantial subsurface scattering here. So let's decrease the subsurface distance to keep this subsurface effect more on the surface and not have it so pronounced into the thicker parts of this mushroom here. And also on my textures tab here, I'll drag this down to subsurface color, enable use texture for this and select the albedo texture that came with it. Make sure to uncheck show sequences as one entry. So after I selected that, we can see now convergence takes a good bit longer. Not surprising as we're adding quite a bit of subsurface samples into our rendering calculations here. Also, let's maybe try this because you can see we are not fully converging here. Let's just go to our render settings, to the comma render properties and increase our pixel samples here to maybe 1020 and also let's dial back the maximum allowed variance. That means how noisy each pixel can be before it stops converging. And you can now see this takes a good bit to render. So let's just converge this. So after a render time of five and a half minutes, you can see our image converged a bit more, although it still would need some samples. At this point, what I could do is I could dive into my render geometry settings and dial in subsurface samples. But what I'm going to do for now is I will disable subsurface. So back in my material library on my mushroom shader, I'll just uncheck use texture for or subsurface and also in the surface tab, we'll dial back the subsurface amount to zero. And down here in my comma render properties, I will dial back my pixel samples to the 128 we previously had. Now let's finally render out some images using the Karma node, which we'll attach below our Karma render properties. And here again, you have a few tabs that allow you to retweak your rendering settings. Maybe depth of field will come through if we enable it here. Who knows? I just want to render out the current frame with this camera. Under the images tab, I'm going to set my output picture to 
a sequence of EXR files. And as always, I'm gonna create a subfolder by just copying this string here and pasting it. So we are storing these files in a separate subfolder. Let's just save this and hit render to disk. And as we're used from Mantra as well, for a single frame, we're not getting a progress bar. So the most reliable way to check if we're rendering is to check the task manager. Under the performance, we see all our CPU cores are working. So let's just wait for the image to be rendered out. All right, let's see what we rendered out. <laughs> and of course, when rendering this out, Karma decided to suddenly enable depth of field, which in the meanwhile, for testing purposes, I set to a grotesquely large amount, a grotesquely small F number. So let's try and set this up again, going to the camera and increasing my f-stop. Um, in my previous attempts, a value of around 100 yielded decent results. I'm not so sure about this anymore, but hey, I mean, let's give it a try. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look at this rendering. And yeah, that is what I'd expect. Well, not with an f-stop of 100, but at least we've got depth of field now. So to sum this up, I'm a bit at a loss when it comes to Karma. I see its huge potential. I would love to be using it more often to render out my creations that I do in stops, bringing them into lobs, into the stage context here and using Karma to render them interactively. However, at its current stage, and I mean, Karma is still in beta, it just behaves a bit too unpredictable, it is lacking some features, depending on the air pressure or humidity, has the tendency to crash. And although a good bit quicker than Mantra, is not the fastest rendering engine out there. But on the other hand, I'm seeing its potential. So once this engine is out of beta, it might actually be a viable and good option if you don't own or don't want to use a third party rendering engine. However, until then, I would suggest using it for experiments here and there. However, under no circumstances can I currently recommend relying on this for production. So that was our experimental excursion into using Karma. I hope you experienced more fun than frustration. And if you want to hear more about the areas of Houdini that we actually know how to use or just plainly want to support us, consider becoming a Patreon. And to everyone out there supporting us already, thanks so much. You are the reason why Antagma is possible. And a very special thank you goes out to Important Looking Pirates, Patrick Fillion, Chris Ebear, and Rafik Anadol. Thanks so much, guys. So, as always, until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.